Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, I'm going to attempt today to do part two of the study of Paul onlyism. Uh, I was able, unable to do this last Sunday because of computer problems. Uh, my computer is ruined now, I guess. It, I can't use it at all. So I've been unable to really do anything uh, as far as uh, making videos or doing hangouts. Um, I'm doing this on my wife's computer and I'm trying to uh, make it work, but she doesn't have all of the uh, proper uh, programs installed. So I'm, I'm hoping I can make this work. I'm, I'm going to do this just as an individual rather than a group discussion, because I'm not even sure that uh, it's going to work. Um, but I want to um, hopefully conclude the teaching uh, refuting Paul onlyism or defending Jesus, John, and Peter. If you did not see part one of this study, uh, it, it is on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. Please watch it, um, and you'll understand why this is so important that we uh, refute this false teaching of Paul onlyism, sometimes called hyper-dispensationalism, ultra-dispensationalism, Bullingerism. It's a rel relatively new phenomenon. It's a relatively small faction of Christians that are in that camp. Uh, I said at the beginning of the <clears throat> first show on this subject uh, that <clears throat> these Paul onlyists <clears throat> should not be regarded as uh, cultists, uh, it, even though it's a false way of interpreting the scriptures, and I do consider it heretical, um, I, I also do consider these Paul only as to be uh, true saints. Uh, they believe in salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. But they add one more caveat, and it is from Paul alone. They believe that you can only be saved by the writings of uh, the Apostle Paul. So that's what this is all about, to refute that teaching. And it's not meant to uh, uh, cause a division between those uh, saints and the rest of us. Uh, they're, as I said, it's a, it's a relatively small faction, but they're very busy working at trying to convert people to their way of thinking, to their way of understanding how to, what they call, rightly divide the scriptures. But they're not really rightly dividing it. They're over dividing it. They're overdoing it. Um, Brother Sebastian Dresden sent me a, a comment that he'd like to see the, the term rather than rightly divide the scriptures. He'd like us to take the attitude of rightly uniting the scriptures. And I told him I would try to adopt that term. I think it's the correct way of looking at it instead of trying to divide things up and, and, uh, the way that the hyperdes and even regular dispensationalists do we need to unite the scriptures together understand how it all works together uh and the the, the message of of uh, god provide, providing a savior uh is is from the beginning of genesis all the way through the end of revelation we see this it's and it, it we can unite all the scriptures together to uh come to the same conclusion that uh, we we cannot be saved through personal merit. We cannot be saved through our uh, own efforts. Uh, we have to understand that we need to throw up our hands in defeat and admit that we're lost and helpless and we need to be saved and understand that the, the Savior that God provided is the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins and rose from the dead, proving he is God and he does have the power of life and death. And if we put our faith completely in him, no longer believing in ourself, no longer believing in our own ability to get to heaven, but rather believing in Jesus for our salvation, he gives us this free gift of salvation and eternal life. So that's, uh, they, the Paul only do believe in this, but they make the mistake of thinking that this can only be learned from the apostle Paul. So I'm going to pick up where I left off in the study, 
And let me scroll down to my notes to see where I was. I should have done this at the beginning. Please, please go back and watch the first episode. It's very important you get the first part uh, to understand this uh, before I go on. Um, okay, so now the question is, was Paul the exclusive apostle to the Gentiles? Um, we know that this term apostle to the Gentiles is in the scriptures, but uh, the Paul Onius believed that exclusively Paul is to the Gentiles. Exclusively Paul is for the church. And, and uh, you cannot uh, receive this message of salvation from any of the other apostles. And you certainly could. They also say you cannot receive it from reading the words that came directly out of the mouth of Jesus. So that's where they're wrong. But I'm going to show you now how Paul is not the only apostle to the Gentiles. Let's start at Acts 11.1. One. It says, And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, Thou wentest in to men uncircumcised, and didst eat with them. You see, this is important to understand that uh, the, uh, the Jews and even the Jewish believers, those Jews who now were believing in Jesus, uh, they thought that uh, the Gentiles would, were not included in this God's plan for salvation. They thought this was exclusively for Israel. Uh, and they also knew, had the custom of not associating. It was really a segregated society. They, the Jewish people would not associate with non-Jews, which were either Gentiles or Samaritans. A Samaritan is someone who is part Jew, part Gentile. Uh, they're not pure Jew. So if you um, is saying here that the apostles were really surprised that, that Peter had gone into these uh, Gentiles, these uncircumcised people, and he, he even ate with them. He ate non-kosher food, food that's forbidden for the Jews. It goes on to say, verse 4, but Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning. That means he, he recounted this, what exactly happened and, and expounded it by order unto them. So he clearly explained exactly how this uh, all came about, why he, in, why he did that. He saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. A certain vessel descend, as it, uh, as it had been a great sheet let down from heaven by four corners, and it came even to me. Upon the which, when I had fastened my eyes, I considered and saw four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And I heard a voice saying unto me, Arise, Peter, slay and eat. But I said, Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean hath at any time entered into my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven. What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. And this was done three times. And all were drawn up again into heaven. And behold, immediately there were three men already come into the house where I was, sent from Caesarea unto me. And the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. So he's recounting this vision uh, that God was uh, uh, telling him that the foods that were forbidden for Jewish people to eat, 
that Peter should no longer consider them forbidden. They're now acceptable. This is no longer applies. This is part of the removal of all Judaism from Christianity. Uh, you know, they at one point they said there's no more circumcision, and at this point they're talking about there's there's no more forbidden foods. Uh, verse 13 says, and he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said unto him, send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. So, uh, obviously, we're talking about uh, salvation in the sense of, of uh, saved from judgment, condemnation from God, and and given the, the gift of eternal life in heaven. That's that's the kind of saved that is the subject here, not being saved from you know persecution or or, or saved from some natural disaster or saved from starvation. Uh, this is talking about salvation, eternal life in the kingdom of God. It says, whereby thou, uh, you, who shall tell thee words, whereby thou shalt, thou and thy house shall be saved. So these people are coming to Peter because uh, they also received a vision or, or an angel appeared and told them, go see Simon Peter. He has a message for you and he's going to tell you how all of you can be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them, as on the as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. So this part is explaining that. As Peter was explaining to them the, the gospel about Jesus, who he was, what he did, and, and uh, this good news, as they began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them. So obviously, they're listening and they're believing. They're accepting this message from Peter. And as they believed, the Holy Ghost came on them. And they were baptized with the Holy Spirit, baptized, indwelled, and sealed with the Holy Spirit. They became Christians at that moment. And verse 17 says, For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you recognize the terminology there believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Probably one of the most used verses and loved verses in all of Scripture for all of, for all of us uh, biblical Christians, all of us who believe that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, is Acts, verse 16, 30 and 31. The Apostle Paul and Silas were at the prison. The jailer asked them, what must I do to be saved? What's the requirement for salvation, Paul? And they answered, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Don't you love that verse? <laughs> it's one of my favorites. I use it all the time. I hear everybody using that verse. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and then shall be saved. That's easy believism. That's the simplicity of the gospel. Put your faith on Jesus. Don't put your faith in Judaism. Don't put your faith in Roman Catholicism. Don't put your faith in any religion. Don't put your faith in your own ability. Believe on Jesus. Well, we, we know it's in, Paul said it in Acts 16, 31. But this, this is... A, Peter talking. This is Peter, and this is uh, this is Acts uh, eleven, 
uh, seven, verse 17. Peter says, For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us. What is the gift he's referring to? Well, in this case, there's two things that could be called the gift. One is salvation is a gift. Uh, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we know that salvation, eternal life, is a gift from God to all those who believe in Jesus. Uh, but we also know that the Holy Spirit is a gift. Uh, who has, the Bible says, that God has given all believers, has given us the Holy Spirit. So that's a gift. So in this case, it says, for as much then as God gave them the light gift as he did unto us. So Peter is saying, God gave them salvation. God gave them the, the baptism and the filling and the sealing of the Holy Spirit, just as he did unto us. What is he referring to as he did unto us? He's talking, referring back to Pentecost, when the first people got saved, when the first people uh, became Christians. See, this, I talked about this in part one. The uh, Christianity, uh, the church, it began at Pentecost when people were first uh, sealed with the Holy Spirit. Uh, whereas Paul only is, uh, they, they don't believe it's church started at Pentecost. They believe a church started either at Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus or Paul's later in Paul's life when he was in prison. Uh, and uh, that's a really extreme position. But there's different factions of, of uh, ultra or hyper dispensationalist, Paul only is, different degrees of it. But uh, they're all wrong. Uh, the church did start at Pentecost, and it started before Paul. It says so right here. Uh, it says, For as much then as God gave them like gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter said this term before Paul did. Believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he said that the people did. Just like he said, just like us, as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter is saying two things. That, that originally at Pentecost, we who believed on Jesus Christ received these gifts. And now this group of people that Peter talked to, that God sent him to, uh, who were Gentiles, Peter is saying, just like us, they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and they received the gift salvation, and the Holy Spirit. So Peter says, what was I that I could withstand God? See, he's defending himself to these uh, Jewish believers. I believe it's James and, and his uh, faction of the early church in Jerusalem who wanted to hold on to Judaism and wanted to, and thought that it was only, Christianity was only for Jews. Uh, he, he's defending himself saying, don't blame me. I didn't have any choice in this matter. God sent me there. God compelled me to tell the Gentiles to eat with them, to eat non-kosher food, to associate with them. Those are all forbidden before. And, and then when I told them the good news about Jesus, just like us, they believed on Jesus and they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. So he's saying, don't blame me. What was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. So at this point, they are accepting the fact that God is also offering salvation. Jesus is also available as Savior to the Gentiles, not just the Jews. They're accepting that. That God hath also to the Gentiles. He's also given Gentiles. He's given them repentance unto life. Repentance means that if they will change their mind about their previous viewpoints about you know the afterlife, uh, religion, going to heaven by some other means, if they will just repent, change their mind, and now understand and believe that, put their faith in Jesus, and they receive eternal life. Now we go to. 
that's what happened there. So you, we can see that Peter uh, preached to the Gentiles, and we're going to find out, was this after Paul, for Paul? We, we already know now that Paul was not the only one to preach to the Gentiles. We have this example here in Acts where Peter is printed, uh, preaching uh, to the, uh, the Gentiles, Cornelius and his family. Uh, and the message he preached to them is uh, simply believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and they got saved, just like the first, the early church in, in uh, Pentecost. Um, so now we know that uh, Paul was not the only apostle that preached to the Gentiles. And it was the same message, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go to Acts 15, 7 now. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, brethren, you know that in the early days, uh, this, is, this is a totally different scene, and, and Peter is recounting this whole thing again. Uh, after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, brethren, you know that in the early days, God made a choice among you that by my mouth, the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. That's Peter talking, and he's declaring to the church in Jerusalem, the council, James, and all the others. Peter is saying up and says, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth, by Peter's mouth, the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel. The gospel? That's the good news. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. That's all they had to do was believe. Believe the good news. And Peter said he was appointed. God made a choice among them that by Peter's mouth the Gentiles would hear the gospel and believe. So it's really, really clear from these two accounts here that Peter was the apostle to the Gentiles. Uh, now we know that Paul is also the apostle to the Gentiles. So we've already established right now that Peter, that Paul is not the only apostle to the Gentiles. And, and we know that we also know now that Paul and Peter are preaching the same message, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. In verse eight, Acts 15, verse eight, and, uh, and did to us, and he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Peter says that there, God made no distinction between the Jewish believers and these new Gentile believers, no distinction. You understand that? There's not two groups of believers, the church and the Jews, the, 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 the uh, gospel of the grace of God and the gospel of the kingdom where the, where the, the Messiah set up a kingdom. No, that is baloney. It says right here, Peter says, God, he, he made no distinction between us, the Jewish believers, and them, the Gentile believers, cleansing their hearts by faith. So we learn a lot here from these verses that the Jews and the Gentiles, there's no different message of salvation, no distinction, no difference. It's the message of faith. And verse 10 says, Now therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? See, the debate at that time was, uh, should we, uh, okay, we've accepted that the, uh, the Gentiles can also believe in Jesus. They can also, uh, they're part of this, uh, the God's plan for salvation. They, they've, they're accepting that. But see, the, the beginning of the church, watch my series on uh, of a playlist titled, uh, 
shocking facts about the book of James that I, I point out in a lot of videos on that series about how the early church, uh, headed by James in Jerusalem, uh, they, they believed that, uh, that as Jews, they must continue practicing Judaism, circumcision, you know, the, the, the forbidden foods, following the law, and all those things were still to be done. Uh, and in addition to that, they need to believe in Jesus. Uh, they thought that uh, Judaism would continue along with believing in Jesus. But uh, so they, uh, they were proven wrong later because that's the argument that Paul was, was fighting against in many of his letters, particularly in Galatians, when, when Paul was saying, the Judaizers have come into my churches and they're trying to make you follow Judaism. And that's another gospel. So, but don't listen to them. Even if an angel tells you this, don't listen to them. It's, it's a, they're, they're cursed if they tell you that you've got to also practice Judaism. You've got to also follow the law. You can also do works. Now, this salvation is a free gift through faith alone in Christ alone. So, but in the beginnings of the church, the Jewish believers didn't realize two things. One, that works were, and Judaism were no longer part of this, but also that uh, uh, the Gentiles would be part of it. They're included and they're equal and they're, there's no distinction. Uh, so verse 10, it says, Now therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? Peter's arguing that why are you trying to get these Gentile believers why are you insisting now that they've got to follow Judaism? They got to get circumcised. They got to follow the law. He says, we couldn't do it. And now you're trying to pose it on them. It's impossible. Peter understood that following the law was impossible. He says, placing upon the neck of the disciples, a yoke, which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. P Peter understood that it was impossible to follow the laws of Judaism. And verse 11 says, but we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they are also are. Oh, Lord, help them. Help them understand this. Help the Paulonians see the truth now. Verse 11, again, but we believe Peter is talking to the Jewish church, the Jewish believers in Jerusalem at this point, but we believe that we are saved through the grace. The grace. Isn't that the gospel of the grace of God? That we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ in the same way as they also are. The same way. Peter understood that the Gentiles were saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and they must not, the, the Jewish believers must not impose any religious works on them, must not impose Judaism on them. And he's saying, we believe that we're saved the same way as them. He's saying that we shouldn't be practicing all of these religious things either. We can't do it. It's a yoke that we couldn't bear. So we see here that Peter is not only preached to the Gentiles. He preached the grace of God, faith alone, and, and it was not a different gospel. He says that it's, they're the same. There's no distinction between us and them. And he says, and, and uh, it, we're saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they are. The Jews and Gentiles, it's the same way of salvation. Now, so now we've established that Peter and Paul both preached to the Gentiles. Peter and Paul both preached free grace. It was not a different gospel. Now, here's something that will shock the Paulonius. Who was the first? Who was the first apostle to preach to the Gentiles? Let's look at Paul's conversion. It was uh, commonly believed his conversion was 35 AD. And these are just some notes from research here. This is at the end of Galatians 1 and at the beginning of chapter 2. 
Paul gives a general account of the initial stages of his ministry. Quote, I did not consult any man, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was. But I went immediately into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. Then after three years, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. Cephas, that's another name for Peter. So Paul says that, that he didn't consult with any man. He got his message directly from Jesus. He didn't uh, go to Jerusalem in, in, in a, where, the other, where the apostles were. He calls them apostles. He recognized them as apostles. Uh, and an apostle is part of the church, isn't it? Uh, and be, he says, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was. Don't you understand? Paul was not the beginning of the church. Paul was not the first apostle. Paul was not the only apostle for us, the church. Paul recognizes right here, they were apostles before him. Earlier, I proved that Paul denied that he was the first member of the church. He said he persecuted the church. Before he was saved, he was persecuting the church. And Paul also claimed that there he mentioned several names of people. They were in Christ before him. So Paul was not the first one to get saved. Paul is not the first member of the church. Paul is not the only apostle to the Gentiles. Paul is not the only one preaching uh, free grace, and he's not the uh, first one, as you'll see here, to be an apostle to the Gentiles. So he said, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went immediately into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. Then after three years, there was a three-year delay here. I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Stephen and Peter, stayed with him 15 days. Later, I went to Syria and Cilicia. So he saw Peter. He didn't see any of the other apostles. Three years after Paul got saved, he finally met Peter. Uh, up to that point, the only information, the only knowledge he got was from directly from Jesus. Then 14 years later, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation and set before them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. This was the council at Jerusalem where, God, where Paul and Barnabas they had to go there and straighten out this mess that was happening in the churches that Paul had established. Uh, Jewish believers were coming in and ruining everything. Uh, Paul told them they're saved by believing in Jesus and, and nothing else. And they were coming and say, the Jewish believers would say, that's not enough. You've got to also get circumcised. You've got to also follow the laws of, of Moses. And so, Paul and Barnabas went down to Jerusalem and had a meeting with the apostles to straighten all this out. And so, uh, but the important thing is the time that lapses here. Now, here's the question. If Paul's conversion was in the year 35, if we accept that, that's the general consensus, the 35 AD, that's when Paul was on the road, road to Damascus and got saved. He worked, quote, a long time, unquote, in Damascus. Then he went off a short visit to, to visit Jerusalem. He was, he was, quote, three years in Arabia, unquote, and in Syria and Cilicia so long that only 14 years later did he visit Jerusalem again. So, evidently, these 14 years must be counted from Paul's conversion. 
And thus, 3580 plus 14 plus the long time period, quote, long time, unquote, period in Damascus, that is perhaps almost another whole year. That would point to the year 50 AD when his first missionary journey is often placed. Though these approximate estimates make one ask where Paul had worked in those intermediate years and what universal and human conclusions can be drawn from this long delay. Well, that's not a question I'm going to attempt to answer in the study right now. The point we want to establish here and now is who preached to the Gentiles first? We can see here that Paul got saved in 35 AD. Uh, and we see that all this time passed and in 50 AD is when he went on his first missionary journey. So 50 AD, we know that Paul was actively preaching to the Gentiles and starting churches. Uh, so now we know that well, Paul was not the only free grace preacher. He was not even uh, he was not the only one preaching to Gentiles. And now we know that he was not even the first free grace preacher to the Gentiles because when Peter was talking to Cornelius, that gets back to 37 AD. 37 AD is when Peter preached to Gentiles. 50 AD, we know Paul was preaching on his ministry. So I think we can conclude here a set, bunch of things. Uh, one, uh, Paul is not the exclusive apostle to the Gentiles. We know Peter also preached to the Gentiles. Paul and did not preach a different message than Peter. They both preached, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They both preached, don't put a yoke on the believers that we couldn't endure. Peter said that. We don't add legalism, don't add Judaism, just we can't do it, don't impose it on them. That was the message that Paul was giving in, the, in all his churches. Don't add anything. And, and it, 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 it's grace or it's works. It can't be a combination of both because uh, if you add works, it's no longer grace, is what Paul said. So they're both preaching to Gentiles. They're both preaching free grace, no works. But now we know that Peter was doing it before Paul. Now, I've had some people attacking me that this is one of the most annoying thing with dealing people here uh, in this ministry that I'm doing is that uh, there are many people that make comments without watching a video. Uh, they see the title of the video and they immediately want to make a comment and refute me. Uh, and they, it's obvious from their comment they didn't watch the video because their comment uh, it gives away the fact that I know they didn't watch the video because if they did, they couldn't make such a comment because I never said such a, such a thing. Such as some people saying that I'm attacking the Apostle Paul. Now, if you're going to be honest, there's nothing I've said today. There's nothing I've said in the previous part one. There's nothing I've said in my entire life attacking the Apostle Paul. I've made videos defending the Apostle Paul against those people who say he was a false apostle. Check my records. Check the videos I have available. You'll see I've defended them, defended Paul. I've said numerous times that I love Paul above all the other apostles. So if you're a Paul only, don't try to act like you love Paul more than me. I love Paul as much as anyone. I value what he did. I value what he endured, the sufferings he went through, the persecutions. I value the message that he, the clarity of his message. But I'll, I'll not make him the exclusive apostle and say, John and Peter and even Jesus don't matter because only what Paul said matters for our salvation. And I won't say that not only do John and Peter and Paul not matter, but they even preach a false a message, a different message that can't save us. 
That's what the Paulonians are saying. You can't get saved from Jesus' words. You can't get paid, saved from Peter. You can't get saved from the gospel of John. That's what they teach. That's where I draw the line, and that's where I have to say, no, I love the Apostle Paul. He's a true apostle. He's one of the greatest heroes in the scriptures. I think second only to Jesus. But I, I won't also not discard all the others and say that and diminish them act like they don't matter i will defend peter john and jesus now i want to make a point now that uh, we know that paul was not the only apostle to the gentiles peter preached to them we know that uh, he did not Paul was not the only one preaching free grace. Peter preached it. And, we, and now we know that Paul wasn't even the first one to preach free grace to the Gentiles. It was Peter. Uh, but what about all the other apostles? What did they do? If Paul, was Paul Paul's the only apostle to the Gentiles? Well, let's look at the historical record now. Where did the other apostles go to preach? The New Testament tells of the fate of only two of the apostles, Judas, who betrayed Jesus, and then went out and hanged himself, and James, the son of Zebedee, who was executed by Herod about 44 AD. Now, uh, Peter and Andrew were brothers. We know that. And the apostle John and James were the sons of Zebedee, uh, the sons of thunder, they're called also. Uh, they were brothers. So this James here, James, the son of Zebedee, says he was executed by Herod about 44 AD. Now, th this we know in the scriptures. Uh, what the fate of Judas and the fate is of J the apostle James. This James was not the author of the book of James. It's a totally different person. Watch my video playlist on shocking facts about the book of James. Because some people think that the Apostle James of the, the original 12 was the same as this uh, author of the book of James. Not so. Okay, so we the, the, the scriptures only tell us about the fate of two apostles. But what happened to the other apostles? Well, there are historical records that we can draw upon. Uh, um, Jesus told them to go to the whole world, preach the gospel. Let's see where they went. Reports and legends about abound, and they're not always reliable, but it is safe to say that the apostles went far and wide as heralds of the message of the risen Christ. An early legend says, they cast lots and divided up the world to determine who would go where, so all could hear about Jesus. They suffered greatly for their faith, and in most cases, met violent deaths on account of their bold witness. Now, what I'm going to go through next, uh, some people, I know there a lot of people are real quick to criticize, uh, and you'll say, well, that's not scripture. Well, I'm not claiming it is. But the, the, the historical records uh, are making these claims. So let's examine this and see if we can learn anything about what happened to the other apostles. Uh, Peter and Paul were both martyred in Rome about 66 AD during the persecution under Emperor Nero. Paul was beheaded. Peter was crucified upside down at his request since he did not feel he was worthy to die in the same manner as his Lord. Okay, so we know uh, that Paul went all over the world establishing churches. He was, a, he was a, an evangelist. He was a church planter, a missionary. He was not a pastor that stayed in one spot, just leading one church. Uh, uh, that's, that's recorded in the scriptures, the history of what Paul did. And, and then... Of course, we know that in Paul's fat last letter, I think it was the last letter to Timothy, uh, he talks about how he's about to be executed. He's thankful that he spared the mouth of the lion. In other words, he was not going to be thrown to the lions and 
killed that way, he was going to be beheaded because he was a Roman citizen. So he would have this more merciful type of death. Uh, so we know that from the scriptures that much about Paul's life, and we certainly can't argue that he traveled around outside of Israel, outside of Jerusalem. And we know that here, it says, uh, Peter, we don't really know where he went. It says, uh, it says that here, there's in historical records that he was martyred in Rome. I'm not sure that can be proven that Peter was martyred in Rome, but the historical records uh, seem to show that. So now let's look at the Apostle Andrew. He went to the, quote, the land of the man-eaters, unquote, in what is now the Soviet Union. Christians there claim him as the first to bring the gospel to their land. He also preached in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, and in Greece, where he is said to have been crucified. So, if the Paulonius claim is true, though only the Apostle Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles, then as we go through all these apostles, and we see that they're not talking just to Jews. They're not just staying in Israel talking to Jews. They're not staying just in Jerusalem, but they're going out to non-Jewish people, to the Gentiles all over the world. Why would they be going out to all these Gentiles? Would they be preaching the gospel of the kingdom? This so-called Jewish gospel that the Paulonius claimed as another gospel that is, is preached by everyone apart from Paul? Or would they be preaching uh, to Gentiles the message of salvation through faith in Jesus? So I don't think Andrew and these others are out there trying to uh, convert all these people to Judaism and, and make them believe in that Jesus is coming back to set up his kingdom. And, no, that's not the message you're preaching. Now let's look at Thomas. We know about Thomas, uh, his experience with Jesus, where he doubted the resurrection, and Jesus appeared to him, and Thomas touched his wounds and said, my Lord and my God. And, well, what happened to Thomas? Thomas was probably most active in the area of east of Syria. Syria. Tradition has him preaching as far east as India, where the ancient Marthoma Christians revered him as their founder. They claim that he died there when pierced through with spears of, from four soldiers. So we know that Thomas was preaching in Syria, or we believe Thomas was preached, preached in Syria and as far east as India. Again, He's not preaching to Jews. He's preaching to Gentiles in a different country, just as Jesus told him to do. So we, we see that Andrew and Peter were also apostles to Gentiles. What about Philip? Philip possibly had a powerful ministry in Carthage in North Africa, and then in Asia Minor, where he converted the wife of a Roman proconsul in retaliation of the proconsul had uh, Philip arrested and cruelly put to death. So the historical record says that Philip had a ministry in Carthage, that's North Africa, and in Asia Minor. So again, Andrew, Thomas, and Peter were apostles to Gentiles. They're not, they're just going to Jewish countries, to Jewish congregations, they're going to Gentiles. What about Matthew, the tax collector, and writer of, of the Gospel of Matthew? Historic record says he ministered in Persia. Persia is now called Iran. And Ethiopia, that's in Africa. Some of the oldest reports say he was not martyred, while others say he was stabbed to death in Ethiopia. So another of the original 12 apostles going off and preaching other lands to Gentiles. Bartholomew had witnessed missionary travels, had, had widespread missionary travels attributed to him by tradition to India, 
with Thomas back to Armenia and also to Ethiopia and Southern Arabia. There are various accounts of how he met his death as a martyr for the gospel. The point I want to drive home here is that uh, we know Paul preached to the Gentiles, we know Peter preached to the Gentiles, and now we're seeing that all of the apostles were preaching to the Gentiles. Now let's look at James, the son of Alphaeus. This is a different James, uh, but he's one of the original 12. Uh, is one of the least uh, one of at least three James referred to in the New Testament. There is some confusion as to which which is which, but this James is reckoned to have ministered in Syria. The Jewish historian Josephus reported that he was stoned and then clubbed to death. So we're finding like two important facts about the early apostles. Uh, they all went off to different countries, as Jesus told them to do. And they're all preaching to Gentiles. So Paul's not the exclusive apostle to the Gentiles. And they all, they all made a martyr's death. They, are all, they all uh, were willing to sacrifice their lives and be martyrs because they all they all saw the risen Christ. They knew it was true. This resurrection proved to them and gave them the confidence that uh, they could believe in Jesus, that he's God and he's Savior because he appeared to them resurrected. Simon the Zealot. So the story goes, ministered in Persia and was killed after refusing to sacrifice to the sun god. Matthias was the apostle chosen to replace Judas. Tradition sends him to Syria uh, with Andrew and to death by burning. Then we got the apostle John, who wrote the Gospel of John, the Epistles of John, and uh, most people believe wrote the book of Revelation. John is the only one of the com company generally thought to have died a natural death from old age. He was the leader of the church in the Ephesus area and is said to have taken care of Mary, the mother of Jesus, in his home. What a wonderful thing. As Jesus was dying on the cross, he looked down and as a, like a dying wish, he said, John, this is your mother. Mother, this is your son. He asked John to take his place and take responsibility to help Jesus' mother. Mary, and John was faithful and did it. It says, during Domitian's persecution in the middle 90s, he was exiled to the island of Patmos. There he is credited with writing the last book of the New Testament, the Revelation. An early Latin tradition has him escaping unhurt after being cast into boiling oil at Rome. I don't know exactly where John went. Uh, maybe he stayed in Jerusalem, uh, at least until Mary had passed, uh, and because he felt responsible to, to take care of her. And then, of course, he was persecuted for his preaching and, and went to Patmos. Uh, but there's really not much of a record saying what foreign countries he went to, if any. Uh, but we see that Paul is certainly the apostle to the Gentiles. But Peter was the apostle to the Gentiles before Paul. And then we see that eventually all the apostles were the apostles to the Gentiles. And we see today that the, the church is pretty much, pretty much uh, not considered part of Judaism anymore as it was in the beginning. At the very beginning of the church, it was the Jews who believed in their, Jesus was the Messiah, and their Savior. And, uh, they, they were the beginning of the church, but most of Judaism rejected Paul. They tried to preach to all the, Jew, the Jews at that time. Some Jewish believer, people did become believers. Some of them believed in Jesus, but thought they were supposed to continue practicing Judaism. 
until they were corrected by by Paul and understood that they needed to leave Judaism behind. And now it was not based upon following Judaism, but believing in Jesus as their Savior instead. And uh, so we have uh, Paul, the Apostle of Gentiles, Peter, the Apostle of Gentiles, and we have all the Apostles, the Apostles of Gentiles. So the idea that Paul only has claimed that Paul is the exclusive Apostle of the Gentiles is easily disproven. Uh, now, I'm going to end this this one, uh, this lesson right now, and I'm going to pick up next time uh, talking about what did Paul teach, uh, what did uh, Jesus teach, what did John teach and Peter teach, what were they teaching different messages? I've already shown you that uh, a sample that Peter and Paul were both teaching believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, but I'm going to go into great, great detail proving that, uh, no, uh, they all preached the same message. And that will be covered in the next, the next uh, lesson. <clears throat> so I hope you watched part one. If you didn't, please go back and watch part one. It'll make all make more sense to you if you watch it from the beginning. And I'm hoping also that uh, soon I'll be able to uh, have my computer problems all fixed and uh, be running back to normal. And I'll be able to host this and, and have uh, people on the panel and, and discussion. And I, I'm also hoping, I don't know how this turned out, but I'm hoping that the quality of the, the audio at least is, uh, is clear. And so the last thing I want to tell you is that uh, you should have understood this by now, if you watch this, that uh, what, we're, what we're talking about here is the, the beginnings and then the current state of biblical Christianity. What is biblical Christianity? I have a series titled that, Biblical Christianity, and it's... Uh, Four videos, it's eight hours long, but I'll condense it into just a minute now. And that is that biblical Christianity is, is really not religion, it's relationship. In other words, if you're not a biblical Christian now, what I call a Christian, a person who relies completely on Christ for their salvation, uh, I want to tell you how to become a Christian, how to Go to heaven. If I asked you, do you think you're going to go to heaven? And if so, why? How would you answer that question? Most people answer the question saying, well, I, I'm i trying to be a good person. I'm trying to be moral, upright. In fact, I even follow the, the golden rules, but best I can. I even follow the Ten Commandments. I go to church. I did. You have you noticed that everything I said in that uh, way, trying to justify myself was based upon I, I, I. That almost every person I talked to, and this is not just in the United States. This is around the world. This is all the religions are based upon this thing, and that is that I will go to heaven if I am good enough, and I want you to understand. That biblical Christianity tells us none of us are good enough, none of us can become good enough. We need to understand that the, the standard that you must meet is perfection. And you know, if, if you are perfect from birth, if you've never sinned in your whole life and you never are going to sin, then you're going to be fine. But the Bible says that uh, no one is righteous, not even one. The Bible says we all fall short of the glory of God. The glory of God is the standard of perfection. We all fall short. So I'm just asking you to understand that your efforts to get to heaven by saying to God, look what I've done. Am I good enough? 
it, it's not going to work. Scriptures tells us that Jesus will say, depart from me. Worker of iniquity, you've tried to work your way up to heaven and you failed because the standard is perfection. But God, knowing that we are incapable of reaching that standard on our own, uh, God came to our rescue. God intervened. God did an intervention for us, knowing that our situation was hopeless, futile, that we're in a hopeless state. We could not, we could not get to heaven. And we needed a solution. Scripture tells us that uh, God sent his son into the world. The son of God, Jesus Christ. Jesus said he came down from heaven. He said the reason he came down from heaven was to give his life as a ransom for many. He gave his life on the cross. He died, suffered and died on that cross as a ransom, as a payment. A ransom is a payment to set someone free. Jesus died on the cross as a payment to set you free from judgment and condemnation. He died. He was buried. After three days, he was raised from the dead. Scripture says God raised him from the dead. Scripture says the Holy Spirit raised him from the dead. And Jesus even claimed that he would raise himself from the dead. He said, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. So this resurrection that happened was, was real. So real that the apostles who were hiding out and afraid for their lives, when Jesus appeared them, appeared to them three days later in the flesh and they touched him and ate with him, they knew that he was really raised from the dead. They changed from cowards, afraid for their lives, to bold evangelists who all ended up going all over the world telling about this risen Jesus and, and, and uh, at, the, at, the, at the cost of their own lives. So it all boils down to this. You need to understand that you need to be saved. You cannot get to heaven, no matter how hard you try. You can join all the religions in the world. You can become the most religious person in the world. You can follow all the tenets, all the requirements, all the religions, and God will say to you at judgment, depart from me. I never knew you. Biblical Christianity is based on the idea that we admit that we need to be saved. We can't do it on our own. We need to rely on God. And the name of God who saves us is Jesus Christ. The Bible says there's a name above all names. There is no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. The scripture tells us we need Jesus to save us. So if you can understand that you cannot save yourself, you need to be saved. Jesus is the only one who can save you. He died for your sins. He was raised from the dead, proving he is God, proving he has power over life and death. And he said, he promised eternal life to you and me, to everyone. If you just simply put your faith on him, no longer believe in yourself. Instead, believe in him to provide salvation. Trust him. Depend on him. Rely completely on him. Uh, he will come through. He'll keep his promise and give you eternal life. That's biblical Christianity. And if you've never put your faith in Jesus, uh, I hope you'll do it now. If you do, please make a comment on this video and let me know. I'd, I'd be thrilled to hear that. So let me see if I can close this show out now. Uh, I'm going to stop the live broadcast. And uh, for everyone who put their faith in Jesus, I hope that you can now learn to rest. It's not worrying about, you know, things that people tell you that you must do. You realize that salvation, getting salvation, keeping salvation, proving you're, you're saved, it, it, it's not based upon what we do. It's all based upon what Jesus did. What Jesus did and what he promised to do. He paid for all our sins, so sin's not an issue anymore. And what he promised to do is give us eternal life in heaven. And he's faithful. Scripture says even when we are not faithful, he remains faithful. 
So I'm asking you now to just rest in the arms and the love of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ.